wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another episode of SNS Webinars. The speaker for the first session of today is our honored guest from the Philippines, Professor Eric Legaspi. Professor Legaspi is the Chief of Section of Neurosurgery at the Capital Medical Center and also serves as the Associate Professor 6, University of Philippines, Manila, as well as the Danilo B. Soriano Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Philippines. He is the Vice President of the Philippines Neurosurgical Association and he is also a noted speaker to various conferences and workshops conducted all around the world. We are extremely honored to him today at our webinars and today we will be talking about abusive head injury in children. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Germany, Professor Ihab Shiban. He is the Acting Director of the Neurosurgical Clinic at the University Hospital in Augsburg. His research interests are focused upon spine surgery and is also a noted author with over 67 publications in various peer reviewed journals and also the author of eight books and more than 200 of lectures in various conferences and workshops. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars and today we'll be talking about indications for lumbar fusion. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from India, Professor Virendra Dio Sinha. Professor Sinha is the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at the Sankot Badurlab Ji Memorial Hospital come Medical Research Institute, Jaipur, India. He was the previous head of Department of Neurosurgery at the SMS College Jaipur and is currently the General Secretary of the AASNS. He served as the past chairman of WFNS Neuro Rehabilitation and Construct Reconstruction Neurosurgery Committee and we are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Eric Likaspi. The chair for the second session is our honored guest from Pakistan, Professor Salman Sharif. He is the Chief of Neurosurgery at the Liaquat National Hospital and Medical College, Karachi. He is the current president of the World Spinal Column Society and the co-chair of the Spine Committee of the WFNS. He served as the past president of the Pakistan Society of Neurosurgeons and was a committee member of WFNS, Endoscopy Committee and the Executive and Education Committee of the ACNS. We are extremely honored to him today to chair the session of Professor Ihab Shiban. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Lubun Singh from Malaysia is my co and also a very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. With that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Virendra Dio Sinha. Good evening to everyone, and uh, first I want to thank Professor Yoko Kato. Dr. Vinzyu, Dr. Raja K, and Dr. Liu Seng for inviting me for this very prestigious session. And, uh, I, um, and uh, I'm honored by introducing and chairing session of Dr. Eric. I, I think Dr. Eric forgotten me. We, I think we met in Jerusalem recently. Uh, I think we probably did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, Dr. Eric is uh, um, already been introduced. He is the Chief of Neurosurgery Capital Medical Center, University of Philippines, Manila. And he completed his degree of uh, medicine in 1986 and postgraduate neurosurgery degree in 1994. He had a number of fellowships. Uh, that important one is uh, from University of Lozi Villa, from Karnaski in the PDG. Neurosurgeons 1994 and um, Spine Fellowship in same time. And uh, very important, he has done Masters in Hospital Administration in 1999. And uh, he has a number of national and international publication. He will be talking, presenting his presentation on abusive head injury, the non-accidental injuries in trauma in children and they are the most common cause of death after trauma in infancy. And it is reported 24% and infant, it is high incidence. And if proper history is not given, then sometimes it is very difficult to uh, diagnose even by imaging. And uh, in number of places, we have to do DD from the meningitis, birth trauma, or severe high so, uh, Dr. Eric uh, will be presenting very important presentation on this uh, NAI injuries and very important in clinical practice as well. And can I um, um, into, um, can I request Dr. Eric to start his presentation and invite now invite him? Thank you, Dr. Eric. Please. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to give a lecture. No, uh, like I told Dr. Christian Kuti, you cannot say no to Yoko Kato. 
Anyway, I would like to talk about the neurosurgical aspects of abusive head trauma. Now, okay. Now, abusive head trauma has long been in the, in the realm of neurosurgery. Now, the first uh, reports of uh, subdural hematomas associated with child abuse came out in the 1800s. And uh, the, sy the syndrome of the battered child was crystallized in 1962. And this early, the, uh, the, crit the principal factor of a subdural hematoma was already noted, as well as the duty of the physician to, uh, to require a full evaluation of the problem and guarantee that no expected repetition of the trauma could be permitted to occur. Now, the, uh, the child abuse really became a neurosurgical topic due to the work of this man, Norman, Norman Gutkelch, who published the uh, first uh, close association of shaking a child to uh, intracranial injury. Uh, Gutkelch pointed out that a good shaking in their society was felt to be more acceptable and physically less dangerous than a blow to the head. But this was a dangerous mechanism of uh, injury because the relatively large head and puny neck muscles of the infant rendered it uh, particularly vulnerable to whiplash injury. So with the work of Gutkelch, ab abusive head trauma came into the realm of neurosurgery. <clears throat> now, abusive head trauma is the term adopted by the American Academy of Pediatrics to replace the term shaken baby syndrome because it's not just shaking which causes the head trauma. Several other terminologies have been used, like the battered child syndrome, shaken baby syndrome, and non-accidental trauma. But abusive head trauma was, the, uh, was adopted by the Centers for Disease Control in 20, 2014. Now, abusive head trauma is defined as an injury to the skull or intracranial comment, uh, contents of a baby or child who is younger than five years old due to intentional abrupt impact and or violent shaking. This is a closed head injury, and it excludes injuries from negligent supervision, gunshots, stabbing, or other penetrating injuries, and it already has its own ICD code. Now, some people have, uh, some countries actually, have objected to the use of the word abusive because it implies an, a, a motive, an intention. And they said that you cannot uh, imply a motive or an intention to a medical diagnosis. So some countries do not use the term abusive head trauma, the Canadians, for example, will call it traumatic head injury due to child mistreatment. They adopted this term in 2020. Brain Injury Australia calls it inflicted traumatic brain injury. And the Crown Prosecution Service of the United Kingdom calls it non-accidental head injury. But they all refer to the same thing. The pathophysiology of abusive head trauma was believed to be the rupture of the bridging veins, which is due to deceleration and acceleration from the child being shaken. Uh, there, is a, there are, of course, other mechanisms here, like the shaking induces hypoxia, and hypoxia le leads to venous and arterial hypertension, which cause cerebral edema and raise intracranial pressure, and that, uh, that results in a vicious cycle. Also, some authors have pointed out that uh, shaking alone is not enough to cause the classic signs of abusive head trauma, and that impact is often involved. So... It's hard to summarize a topic like abusive head trauma in just one lecture. So I would I decided to come up with a few uh, basic points, a few bullet points to uh, which hopefully will stick with the uh, will stick with the younger uh, uh, physicians, and to scatter these points about the uh, during the course of the uh, of your evaluation of a patient who comes in for abusive head injury. So what's the background? What should you have in the back of your mind when you're thinking about abusive head trauma? And the first bullet point is that abusive head trauma, unfortunately, is common. Now, in the United States in 2011, it's very dramatic when a child dies in a vehicular accident. But actually, there were 908 children who died, uh, less, aged less than 13 during this year. And a lot more than that died silently due to child abuse. 1,500, uh, 1500 died from child abuse. So... The, uh, the incidence of, of death from child abuse is actually distressingly high. Here's a study taken from, uh, from, uh, from various countries, which show that there are varying degrees of varying incidences of abusive head trauma, which are, again, strikingly high. And so there, I'm sure that somewhere there is listening a resident who's planning to spend his life treating glioblastoma multiformis. And this is a, you know, this is a, uh, this is a noble endeavor. <laughs> 
But bear in mind that the incidence of glioblastoma multiforme is only 0.59 to 5 per 100,000. It is way outscored by, a breast, by abusive head trauma. Abusive head trauma is much more uh, common than glioblastomas. It seems to be that the more you look for abusive head trauma, the more you'll find it. So here's a graph which shows that in 1990, hardly anybody was being reported for abusive head trauma in Japan. We, uh, look at the year 2012, when it's already gone up beyond 60,000. Of course, it's, it's easy to understand why abusive head trauma would be so hard to diagnose. Uh, the, in our own country, in the, Philippine, in, the, in the Philippines, we've already set up a child protection network, and we found a distressingly low number of reported and documented incidents. So we had, over, our, over uh, three years, we only had 1,300 uh, children who we diagnosed with head injuries. And of these, we were only able to document four as being definitely due to physical abuse. So it should be, the, uh, the young physician should bear in mind that the incidence of abusive head trauma is actually higher than the incidence of, accident, of accidental head trauma. So compare an incidence of 17, an, es an estimated incidence of 17 per 100,000 for abusive head trauma, and for non-abusive head trauma, it's only 15.3. So abusive head trauma is the most common cause of neurotrauma in children younger than two years old. And it should be considered in all children who present with neurotrauma, unless the trauma is without doubt accidental, for example, a car accident. So rather than thinking, hmm, I wonder if this is uh, abusive head trauma, when you see a child with a head trauma, with head trauma diagnosis, you should probably think of it the other way. I wonder if this was not abusive head trauma. Because after all, it is a difficult diagnosis to make. The patient is too young to communicate. The people who you expect to get your history to, to help you in your diagnosis are often making active efforts to obscure the diagnosis. You yourself are very hesitant to make, you should be very hesitant to make the diagnosis because a misdirected diagnosis has extremely grave consequences. And finally, the diagnosis itself, unlike other medical diagnoses, describes a situation rather than a specific mechanism of injury. So that the second point I would like to, to keep the, for the physician to keep in mind before he even sees a case of abusive head trauma is that these patients are usually going to be from young and poor families. So the patients themselves will have a peak incidence of two months. The, average, the usual patient who will come in with abusive head trauma is two months. Uh, the definition runs up to five years, but actually the incidence drops off by the time the patient is two years old because he's already beginning to talk. And when you look at the profile of families who have children ab with abusive head trauma, they are associated with lower income households and the incidences are more frequent during economic crises. So we usually, the whole world just underwent an economic crisis and did this affect the incidence of abusive head trauma? Oh, definitely during the pandemic years when people were stressed, when the economic situation deteriorated, the incidence of abusive head trauma skyrocketed. And finally, it affects a few children over and over again. So 27, this is one reason why we have to make the diagnosis. 27.8% of children who have a misdiagnosis are going to be evaluated for a repeat injury. So the children, the same children will come back again and again with the same problem. When the perpetrator can be identified, it's usually the father figure. Overwhelmingly, it's the father figure. And it's associated with families who are younger, less educated, and usually unmarried. So it's an unfortunate, uh, it's an unfortunate profile, uh, but we can uh, actually profile the, um, the families which are prone to abusive head trauma. So uh, bearing this in mind, when you can see a patient in the emergency room, what are the facts that you should have in mind? And one, a big one is that the patient will give a history and physical examination, which are vague. These are the usual presenting complaints for, for a patient who has abusive head trauma. And take a look at the list, decreased alertness, seizures, lethargy, respiratory distress, hypotonia, vomiting, apnea, irritability. They're all very nonspecific, all very uh, vague comments, very vague complaints. And look at the, the history, the usual history is a patient who will present with none or, or no history of trauma 
or a very mild history of trauma. In fact, the most common complaint for these patients will be the baby fell off the bed. So when somebody comes in, when a child comes in with a significant head trauma and the parents say, oh, he just fell off the bed, is this something that you should believe? There was a study which showed that patients who's, who claimed, families who claimed that a patient fell only one to four feet had, a seven, had patients who had a 7% death rate, whereas patients who fell a documented five to nine feet had no death rate. So this, uh, this is counterintuitive. Why should a patient who falls a shorter distance have a higher death rate? It's because the patient who says, he just fell off the bed less than three, three or four feet, they are probably trying to mislead you. They might be trying to mislead you. Unlike the patient who says he fell five to nine feet, that is a patient, that is a parent, that's a family who's actually looking to help their child. And here, patients who had no reported trauma actually have a higher incidence of subdural hematomas than those who report trauma. So the, uh, the takeaway point from this is that children are usually fall resistant. Now, of course, we cannot do a controlled trial of dropping children on their heads, but when children are observed to fall from hospital beds or observed to fall by reliable observers, then patients who have been observed to fall less than three feet usually show no signs of injury and no serious sequelae. In fact, they, they had trouble documenting a single child with a fall of three feet or less who actually suffered significant sequelae. It seems that you have to fall five or 40 feet more before you get significant trauma. So when a young child, particularly an infant younger than six months, presents with traumatic intracranial pathology and gives either no history of trauma or a history of a minor fall, it must be seriously considered that this history is false. Now, this is the most important point in this lecture, and that there is a pattern of injury which helps us diagnose abusive head trauma. There is no single imaging finding which independently will be diagnostic of abusive head trauma. Rather, you have to consider a constellation of findings and the inconsistency of the history. So what is the pattern of injury in abusive head trauma? Three factors will come out again and again. There will be cerebral injury, retinal hemorrhage, and fractures of the long bones and the ribs. So these factors come out again and again. Now, some people say that the triad of finding an abusive head trauma is actually subdural hemorrhage, retinal, retinal hemorrhage, and encephalopathy, but, uh, we, should, but we, we can also keep that in mind. So looking at, the, uh, looking at the big three, subdural hematoma, retinal hemorrhage, and fractures, we see that report after report states that these are the common findings in patients who have abusive head trauma. Here's another study here. There were subdural hematomas, retinal hemorrhage, and rib fractures come out as significant uh, odds ratio increasers for, uh, for the possibility of abusive head trauma. And of course, notice that the biggest factor which will incre increase the risk of abusive head trauma is when no history of trauma is being given. So again, you'll go back to the fact that uh, you have a history which, is not, which does not support this, uh, a significant head trauma and the presence of subdural hemorrhage, retinal hemorrhage, and rib fractures or long bone fractures. Now, the, the presence of rib fractures and retinal fractures and retinal hemorrhage increases greatly your possibility of having abusive head trauma. So when a patient has, when a child has head trauma, finding rib fractures increases the odds ratio of abusive head trauma by 44.7 uh, times. So the, uh, the, the, uh, this constellation of uh, findings, you know, the, which includes rib fractures, retinal hemorrhage, long bone fractures, head and neck bruising, apnea and seizures, these are constantly found in patients who have abusive head trauma. You keep this in mind because this, these findings have a high positive predictive value. If you see a child with head trauma and a rib fracture or a retinal hemorrhage plus any of the other features, that the odds ratio is more than 100 times that this patient suffered abusive head trauma and the positive predictive value is more than 85%. And it also works the other way around. If you have a patient who had head trauma, if you have a child with head trauma, but you see none of these factors, he has no rib fractures, no retinal hemorrhage, no long bone fractures, none of the other uh, significant findings, then the chance that this child suffered abusive head trauma is actually less than 4%. So it works both ways. If you see these factors, it gives you a high positive predictive uh, value. If you don't see any of these factors, then usually your 
a lot of the time, your head trauma is just accidental. So again, one last time, hopefully, so that people won't forget, the pattern of injury in abusive head trauma is cerebral injury, retinal hemorrhage, and fractures of the ribs and long bones. Now, of all of these, retinal hemorrhage is the one that you have to look for. It's not going to jump out at you. You have to examine for it. So let's take a look at uh, retinal hemorrhage. And the first point that you have to know about retinal hemorrhage is that when you have a child suspected of abusive head trauma, then you have to check these patients early for retinal hemorrhage. It's uh, mandatory that these patients be referred for early indirect fundoscopy. Retinal hemorrhage is a common finding in abusive head trauma. It's found in 78% of abusive head traumas and only 5% of non-abusive head trauma. So the, the odds ratio is 14.7. It's 14.7 times more common in abusive head trauma. And when you do see it in abusive head trauma, the retinal hemorrhage is more commonly bilateral and it's more commonly severe. So retinal hemorrhage associate when you, when you associate retinal hemorrhage with other factors like lethargy or uh, subdural hemorrhage or altered mental status, then the possibility that this child had uh, suffered abusive head trauma goes way up. However, you should be aware that isolated retinal hemorrhage is not that uncommon a finding. You cannot pin your diagnosis of abusive head trauma solely on the finding of retinal hemorrhage. Retinal hemorrhage can be seen in up to 34% of, of neonates. However, if the patient suffered the retinal hemorrhage just because of the birth trauma, it usually resolves by six, uh, by six weeks. So in birth trauma, there's a differential diagnosis for retinal hemorrhage, but the, uh, the hemorrhage usually resolves in two weeks and essentially is all gone by six weeks, and there is no cleavage of the retinal planes. There's no accumulation of blood within the planes of the retina, which is called retinoschisis. So there are other differential diagnoses for retinal hemorrhage. Accidental injury, of course, can cause enough, can cause uh, retinal hemorrhage, but usually accidental injury is a single traumatic event. And so when you do see retinal hemorrhage, there are usually, they're usually few hemorrhages, they're off, more often bilateral, and only severe uh, trauma will, uh, will result in retinoschisis. Tursen syndrome, which is intraocular blood associated with intracranial blood, such as a, a ruptured aneurysm, is also seen but when Tursen syndrome occurs, it's usually uh, in the background of a pattern of venous obstruction. And Tursen syndrome is rare in children who really don't have ruptured aneurysms. And again, there is no retinoschisis. <clears throat> Severe illness and coagulopathy can also cause uh, some retinal hemorrhage, but they're usually fewer and confined to the posterior pole. And even just the presence of severe increased intracranial pressure can uh, cause retinal hemorrhage. But this is usually in the asso associated with a, severe, with a swollen optic disc. <clears throat> so when you examine for retinal hemorrhage, it's important that you do it early because retinal hemorrhage fades very fast. It can clear in, up to, in one to two weeks. So here you see a case which was followed by, uh, by these authors, by uh, Binnenbaum, where on admission, <clears throat> there, there are two numerous to count retinal hemorrhages, but within 14 days, there's already been significant clearing up. And here another case, again, two numerous to count retinal hemorrhages, in two days, significant clearing. In six days, practically complete resolution. <coughs> Excuse me. So retinal hemorrhage is something <clears throat> which you should examine for rather early. So after, after examining the patient, you send this patient now for a laboratory workup. And it's important that you use your laboratory intelligently. And we should focus on the signs of recurrent trauma and hemorrhage. So here's one diagnostic algorithm for the diagnostic of a non-accidental uh, non head trauma, which is a synonym for abusive head trauma. And you look here, the laboratory workup will focus on finding, on looking for a patient who's undergone repeated hemorrhages. So the, uh, the factors that you look for are the low hematocrit, a patient who, who responds to repeated hemorrhage by increasing the platelet count to more than 400, and a consumption of all the coagulation factors, so the INR tends to drop. In fact, the drop in INR is associated with a poor outcome, and it, uh, it actually associates with mortality. After your lab exams, this patient is now sent to imaging. And how do you handle the imaging of a patient in whom you suspect abusive head trauma? A skeletal survey is considered mandatory. There's a policy statement by the American Academy of Pediatrics, which says that <clears throat> 
A skeleton survey is mandatory in all children less than two years old who are suspected of being victims of abuse. A routine babygram is not sufficient. It doesn't give you enough details to document your diagnosis. So your skeletal survey is recommended. And what you're looking for are fractures of the ribs. 79% no, of these patients had one or more healing fractures. And in 50% of cases with, uh, with uh, head trauma, it was the critical factor in diagnosing uh, child abuse. So the, ribs, the rib fractures will occur in characteristic places. Unfortunately, you have to, exam you have to imagine a uh, a, an adult grasping a child and you'll realize that the pressure points, the points where the ribs will fracture are here just off the midline and the posterior, uh, posterior portion of the body. So um, seven out of 10 children who have child abuse will have multiple rib fractures. Also, because of uh, this shaking associated with, uh, with abusive head trauma, there's often separation of the, of the bones along the metaphysis. So metaphyseal fractures are common in these children. These are the long bone fractures that we talked about. For the head, the traditional examination was the CT scan. <clears throat> now, depending on where you live, I'm sure that your hospital has uh, guidelines on who should be subjected to a CT scan. It's not cost effective for, for every patient who comes in with a history or a suspicion of head trauma to be subjected to a CT scan. And so guidelines have been drawn up. So these are the NICE guidelines drawn up, uh, I believe, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. These are the PCARN guidelines drawn up in the United States. This is the Chalice guidelines, again, drawn up in the United Kingdom and the Canadian, uh, the CATCH guidelines drawn up in Canada. So it depends, depending on where you live, there, there are probably guidelines which will recommend that uh, uh, which patients are sent off to CT scan. For children, especially those who you, you suspect uh, suffered child abuse, there are common factors which will push you to getting a CT scan. So all of those guidelines, Chalice, Picarn, Catch, will all suggest CT scans for children very young who are less than two years old who come in with a GCS, which is not perfect, who come in with skull fractures, who come in with a history of, conscious, of loss of consciousness or seizures. It's also important to note three, more, three or more episodes of vomiting or seizures in the absence of a history of epilepsy or a dangerous mechanism, or like we said earlier, no mechanism at all being given for the head trauma. So uh, even though your guidelines, even though your specific guidelines for getting CT scans uh, may vary, there are some common factors which will push you to getting CT scans in young children. And what you're looking for in a CT scan is the subdural hematoma. Now it's, uh, it's a whole topic in itself to discuss the CT scan findings, to discuss radiologic findings in, uh, in the children who have abusive head trauma. So I'll just list down a good reference here, and if you want to look it up. <clears throat> now, there are some factors which, surprisingly, are not associated with abusive head trauma. You would think that these factors, if you see them, these findings on CT scan are going to point you to a child who is being abused, but they are not. Because remember that in abusive head trauma, the mechanism is recurrent, non-lethal trauma. So what are these findings which are not associated with abusive head trauma? Surprisingly, epidural hematomas are not associated with abusive head trauma, and isolated single fractures are also not associated with, with uh, non-abusive head trauma. They are usually the result of single, single points of trauma, which usually points to accidental head trauma. The classic finding in abusive head trauma is the mixed density subdural hematoma. The subdural hematoma, which shows a mixture of acute and subacute hemorrhage, usually in the absence of fractures. It's seen in more than 90% of cases. So the, hy the hypodense or chronic subdural hematoma in a very young child is again, a very sensitive finding, a very, uh, very uh, rather specific finding for uh, abusive head trauma. It's found in 80% 80, 80 specific for abusive head trauma. The, um, the uh, recurrence of the injury also causes hematomas which have multiple layers or because they are chronic, they've broken down into hygromas. And so the findings of multi-layered multi hematomas and hygromas are also highly suggestive of abusive head trauma. There are also some characteristic injuries associated with abusive head trauma. One of them is the tadpole sign. So you have a bridging vein, and because of the shaking mechanism, the vein is torn, 
it hemorrhages and the rest of the vein thrombosis. And this is called the tadpole sign. Also, shaking of the child causes a uh, shearing between the, between the different layers, the, the different density layers of the brain. And so having lacerations, intraparenchymal lacerations in the brain is another common finding. One of the worst findings that you can find, that you can uh, encounter though, is what's called the big black brain. This is hemispheric, hemispheric hypodensity. The uh, mechanism is actually not well understood, but it's a hypodensity of the cortex on the CT scan involving either the entire hemisphere or one of them. And when you see this, it's a, it's a really terrible sign and it predicts practically 50% of, you're going to lose practically 50% of your patients who have it. Also, while you're doing your imaging, remember that other organ systems might be affected in the, uh, as a result of the abuse of head trauma. <clears throat> the uh, mechanism, remember, is, the, uh, is usually shaking, which uh, results in uh, a swinging, a whiplash injury of the child who has a large, poor, uh, large head compared to the body and poorly developed musculature. And so the injury to the cervical spine is considerable, especially to the ligaments of the uh, cervical spine. There's also a significant correlation with hypoxia and brain injury. Now, if you think about these, these are soft tissue injuries, and so they are best diagnosed on MRI and not on plain x-rays or on CT scans. And so uh, recently, there's been a, a lot of interest in spinal cord injuries, which focus on the upper cervical spine, but, and these are related to abusive head trauma. So uh, when you have a child who has an abusive head trauma, consider a spinal MRI. Again, most of the injuries are ligamentous and soft tissue, so 90% of them are going to be missed by CT scan and x-ray, and they'll only be picked up on MRI. Now, you might get some pushback because MRIs are not cheap, and a lot of the time, the MRI will actually not change its management, it will not change the management of the patient because the, uh, the need to fuse a spine in a child this young is actually very small. However, the MRI does give you information on the possible mechanism of injury. It excludes a differential diagnosis and it helps you confirm the diagnosis. So these alone will often justify the expense and the trouble of getting an MRI in a patient who you suspect of having abusive head trauma. You also ought to consider that the abdomen can be injured. The uh, one study showed that they were uh, that uh, there was uh, that abusive head trauma could be associated with liver laceration with um, with injuries to the pancreas and other, other internal organs. Although usually the, uh, these injuries were overshadowed by the head trauma. And so in this study, even though they documented some abdominal injuries, the, there was no increase of morbidity because the morbidity, the course of the patient was dictated by the severity of the head trauma. So thinking about this, you come up with a rather considerable laundry list of uh, recommended examinations for, uh, for a patient in whom you suspect abusive head trauma. The skeletal survey is mandatory. Uh, skull x-rays are, are required for documentation. A cranial CT scan is uh, also recommended in all abuse uh, suspects. If the CT scan is positive, a, cervical, a cranial MRI is helpful. And the spinal MRI is also, like we, dis like, like we discussed, helpful. And if you suspect intra-abdominal injury, then you might have to uh, do a scan of the abdomen and the thorax. Now, you are, of course, we have the, uh, the principle of ALARA, as low as reasonably achievable uh, exposure to radiation. So this is a considerable amount of radiation, and that's why there's been a lot of interest lately in the use of the quick MRI. The quick MRI is an MRI examination, which takes only three to four minutes. Therefore, since it's so short, it avoids the use of uh, sedation or anesthesia. It will lose some of the fine details of a, of a full MRI, but for the important things, for uh, clinically important brain injuries and for uh, enough injuries, for enough uh, uh, details to, uh, to nail down your diagnosis, it is usually enough. It usually suffices. So consider the quick MRI. So now your patient has gone through the emergency room, has gone through diagnostics, and you've admitted this patient in-house. So what are the things that you have to keep in mind when the patient is in-house? And one of the most important things is that you cannot jump to, your, to a diagnosis of abusive head trauma. The, the consequences of a misdirected diagnosis are significant. In fact, if you think about the guy who started this all, Gut Kelch, he spent the last few years of his career defending people 
who had been unjustly charged well, of, uh, of child abuse. He said that he was frankly quite disturbed that what he intended as a friendly suggestion to avoid injury in children became an excuse for imprisoning uh, innocent parents. And he considered one of his major ach achievements in life to be securing the liberty of this man, uh, Drayton Witt, who spent a decade in prison after being wrongly accused of abusing his child. So don't jump immediately to the diagnosis of abusive head trauma. Consider a differential diagnosis. And one of the most difficult, one of the most uh, common differential diagnosis will be benign external hydrocephalus. There are some children who are just born with benign enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces. Usually these children will have slack fontanelles and they'll be in good health. So even in the presence of uh, subdural hemorrhage, which can occur in up to 11% of these patients, all you have to do is just observe these patients. Now, how do you determine the how do you determine who has a benign external hydrocephalus and who has an actual subdural hematoma? Well, in external hydrocephalus, there can be macrocephaly. The head can be significantly enlarged. There is a pattern of enlargement, and the subarachnoid spaces in uh, external in benign external hydrocephalus are usually enlarged over the bifrontal areas and interhemispheric fissure, and there is a minimal increase in inter in the ventricular volume. Also, there is the cortical vein sign. In patients who have benign external hydrocephalus, the veins will be seen running freely through the subarachnoid space on MRI and CT scan. Whereas in, uh, in um, subdural hematoma, they'll often be damaged or pressed out of the way, and you won't see them traversing the space freely. And most important, uh, in benign external hydrocephalus, the child is in good health and usually just uh, the problem resolves within two years. Uh, children who are delivered by uh, vacuum-assisted delivery will also have scalp swelling, which can be mistaken for abusive head trauma. There's no treatment needed for this. And there are actually some metabolic, uh, metabolic uh, diseases which have a predilection for the child to form subdural hematomas. The most notorious of these is glutaric aciduria type 1, in which subdural hematomas are reported in 4 to 30% of these patients. There's a, uh, these patients will present with a wide sylvian fissure, frontoparietal atrophy, and macrocephaly. But you have to be aware if it's present in your own region. So I asked around and I found out that it actually is present in the Philippines. And so it's something which in the Philippines we have to consider as a differential diagnosis for subdural hematomas. So when you have a child with a, uh, who is in-house already with a, uh, with a significant head injury, this admission gives you another chance at recognizing who has, which children actually do have abusive head trauma. And uh, this tool, the PREDAT tool, Prediction of Abusive Head Trauma, was devised to help uh, physicians examine patients who are already admitted with head trauma and decide if this patient merits workup for abusive head trauma. And the features in this tool are head or neck bruising, seizures, apnea, rib fractures, lung bone fractures, and retinal hemorrhages. And the use of this tool is that when you see these, fra when you see these features, there are corresponding increases in the odds ratios that these children were actually abused. And again, as expected, rib fractures and retinal, fra retinal hemorrhages are the most significant factors. When you see three or more of these features in a child less than three years old with a, child with a head injury, the, possibility, the probability that this is abusive head trauma is actually more than 80%. If you see any of these cardinal features in yellow, the rib fractures or the retinal hemorrhage, and it's seen with more than one fracture, then again, your positive predictive value is more than 85%. This tool has been found to be fairly sensitive and fairly specific, and it costs nothing to apply to patients who have been admitted, to very young patients who have been admitted for head trauma. It should be applied to all young patients who are admitted for head trauma. Now, in-house, because we're neurosurgeons, we also have to think about surgical intervention. And here, surgical intervention is as of yet not standardized. If it's not surprising that surgical, uh, surgical intervention is not standardized because the whole of management of head trauma is actually not fully standardized. If you look at the latest edition for the guidelines for treating severe traumatic brain injury in infants, children, and, and adolescents, you'll see that a lot of the recommendations are have only reached level three evidence. So take as an example here. Well, before that, even with the uh, even with the guidelines given, you'll see that the uh, 
that the actual adherence to the guidelines is far from uniform. So this is a survey of three people who treat head injury in children. And they look, do you actually follow the guidelines? And you find that the, uh, the adherence to guidelines is very far from 100%. Take a look here at the use of intracranial monitors, of ICP monitors. This is a guideline published by the Pediatric Critical Care Association. And they say that a patient who has a, a GCS of less than eight, one of your first steps is to insert an intracranial monitor, an intracranial pressure monitor. Now, do people actually do this? The answer is actually no. Uh, in patients who are in children less than 12 months, less than one third of them had actually uh, ICP monitors uh, installed. Uh, most of the physicians would just tend to feel the fontanelle and say, this feels stiff or this feels not stiff. And so the, uh, uh, in this instance alone, the use of ICP monitors, you can see that the, the adherence, the international adherence to guidelines is not really that rigid and that people will more often rely on the basics of controlling intracranial pressure and ensuring cerebral perfusion. When you do decide to do surgery, surgery may need to be aggressive because these are chronic injuries uh, which require treatment, which often, often the patients are, are in deteriorated physical status. And so the, uh, the surgery, uh, abusive head trauma requires surgery more often than non-abusive head trauma. And surgery is notorious for chronicity and complication. Take, for example, the hematohygroma which is a subdural collection containing a mixture of blood products, CSF and protein. And uh, when you see something like this, it's very tempting to just try to do a uh, fontanel tap. And if you do a fontanel tap, it's been found that the, this will very rarely resolve the issue. And it's probably wiser, uh, they, they came up with a study which showed it's probably wiser to go straight ahead and do a burr hole and do controlled external drainage rather than just try to, uh, to, to treat this by uh, simple transfontanel taps. Uh, what, another operation you can use if you want to, uh, which uh, gives you a quick operation and uh, short OR time with a fair success rate is subdural subgaleal shunts where you put a shunt and then just uh, tunnel it out to a large subgaleal pocket. Now this gives you a fair success rate. Uh, but it should be, uh, it should be uh, known that the, uh, they, these hematomas are a bit more difficult to handle than the usual hematomas especially if uh, they're actual hematomas. They actually contain blood. You know, the subdural punctures, external subdural drains may not work that well, and you may have to be more aggressive. So one uh, way of being aggressive is to do mini craniotomies, which gives you the uh, better exposure and which gives you a higher success rate compared to simple uh, burr holes. And of course, if the patient has too, uh, too much damage and too... Uh, and to uh, excessive swelling, you may have to consider hemicraniectomies, although these are, these are difficult uh, patients to handle. They will develop infections. They're in poor physical condition. A lot of them will go on to needing shunts. And so there is a, your outcome will be poorer. The King's outcome score is going to be, high, are going to be poorer. The uh, mortality is going to be higher than in non-accidental non, uh, non trauma. It's higher in non-accidental trauma. So uh, the, uh, it's, hard to give, uh, it's hard to give solid recommendations for how to handle these patients surgically because the, uh, the studies still have to be done. On follow-up, you'll find that your results are also not good. Abusive head trauma is associated with lower GCS scores, with more subdural hemorrhage. They have a higher mortality than accidental head trauma, and they have poorer outcomes with a greater chance of permanent disability. If you look at the long-term long -term, uh, outcomes, a lot of these patients will fall into severe impairment, 40%. Uh, oh, less than one-third one of them will be able to handle a normal school curriculum. 30% will need special education, and their survival tends to be uh, shorter, and there's a significant reduction in the quality of life. So the, uh, the long-term outcome is not good for these patients. And that, uh, that brings me to the last point about abusive head trauma, which is that we have to keep trying. It's a problem which unfortunately has been with us for a long time and which will be with us for some time to, uh, to come. And it's something that we have to look into and do our best to treat for our patients. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Rick, uh, for excellent presentation on this uh, very important topic of abusive head injury. And uh, I think we have covered almost every corner of 
um, this uh, disease. Uh, as per your slide, it is more common in uh, Western countries uh, like uh, New Zealand, US, and all. But we see very less in uh, low income countries like India. So, and the uh, factors you told, to the educational and financial problems. So, what is the, can you discuss about this problem? This issue? Well, uh, again, it's something which it seems that the more you look for it, the more you will find it. So, um, yeah. I don't know if it's an actual, if we actually have lower incidences or if we just don't report it. It's uh, like I said, in the Philippines, we documented a, a, a very low, a disappointingly low number of uh, actual, of documented abusive head trauma cases. Whereas we had a very large number who were, we suspected of being uh, abused children. So it's hard, it's, uh, it might just be a matter of reporting. Uh, any role of ultrasound uh, for diagnosis? Sorry, the any role of ultrasound for diagnosis and follow up in these patients? Oh, yeah. Yes, the um, the those patients who use, who were reported to undergo uh, undergo transfrontal taps, the follow up to see if the subdural effusion had resolved was yeah. usually by ultrasound. Uh, you know, the, it cuts down the radiation exposure. It's very easy to get. And so the follow-up for the uh, for the size of the effusion is usually by ultrasound, but uh, for making the diagnosis itself, it's probably better if we go straight to a CT scan or an MRI. Okay, so um, there are two questions uh, by audience. Doctor Eric is mm -hmm. asked: In abusive head trauma, usually associated multiple small hematoma in parenchyma, in how many cases you have noted? apart from just subdurals? Oh, okay. We do not, unfortunately, we do not keep a, a, um, a, uh, a good registry for these patients, so I cannot give you numbers. But it has been found that, uh, that one of the factors, one of the mechanisms for abusive head trauma is recurrent, uh, recurrent uh, ischemia and hypoxia. And this will often result in multiple small hematomas. So... Uh, they are they are common. They are, uh, but they seem to be less common than the subdural hematomas than the actual formation of subdural hematoma. Okay. Next question is uh, subdural hygroma. What do you do in abusive head injury? The same management or is different? Subdural uh, hygroma. Subdural hygromas. The if you suspect a sub uh, a subdural uh, hygroma due to uh, abusive head trauma, uh, the, I I came across a good article which shows that which said that. Uh, attempting to treat this by repeated taps is a uh, is a disappointing experience, and that uh, it's probably better if you have a patient like this to go straight to doing a um, doing a burr hole, putting a drain, yeah. and then doing a pro uh, a gradual uh, pro programmed uh, drainage of the hematoma. So they recommend that at first you uh, you put in your drain, then you bring down the pressure to you bring your drainage back down to ten to fifteen centimeters above the head. And then after a few days, you bring it down to lower than the head to, to try to obliterate the hematoma. And they showed very good results with uh, with few infections and few recurrences. Uh, I ask, want to ask, uh, the, in the abusive head injury, subdural hematoma is very common. So is there any anatomical variation in children, in infants, which predispose more for this? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, uh, so is there a is there a, is there something in children which predisposes yeah, them yeah, to have it's a more predispose more subdural hematoma in infants and early age and um, age? Well, because, I, I, yes yes I would suspect it's more that the younger children are 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 susceptible to the mechanism for forming the hematoma the you know the 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 incidence of abusive head trauma drops off sharply as soon as the child begins to talk. So officially the age cutoff for abusive head trauma is, is uh, five years old, but in practical terms, it sort of cuts off at two years old because at two years old, the child begins to talk. So is there something which predisposes the child to subdural hematoma? It yeah. is that they are predisposed to the mechanism of forming the hematoma. Or because what I understand uh, in, in infant, in early age, is more volume of water in brain or more wide cervical spaces, 
mm-hmm. weak muscles of neck all, all these factors mm-hmm. which i was knowing uh, if you can add someone i don't know, something more uh, this i know mm-hmm. this is more produced for predisposed to subdural abdominal Oh, yeah, the the neck muscles, the weakness of the med- neck muscles, neck the, pro- muscle. the, the and propensity and to whiplash yeah. injuries was uh, is uh, very commonly noted. Yeah. Uh, if you ask the family uh, history of the the who is take care of the patient in whom it is more common, it is caretaker or is a depressed mother or what is the history usually you see we see in these type of patient. more oh. covered with caretakers or depressed mothers or what type of mother or <laughs> parents are there i guess that would be a very societal related uh related answer because like in the philippines it would probably be a family member because we can't afford caretakers so it would probably be somebody from the family itself and uh okay. you know but overwhelmingly it seems to be a male figure and mm-hmm. if there is a uh I read a paper which says that in societies where they have non-related caretakers and related caretakers it will more often be a non-related caretaker somebody who has no emotional investment in the child okay okay and uh, any specific mri scans which tells better about the diagnosis of a trauma Pardon any me. specific any specific mri scans which give more information about this oh St- aside from the standard mri i would assume the standard sequences the uh, checking for blood breakdown products okay you see there, there is great there people have been talking a lot now about using the rapid mri sequences which uh, which are limited but which will give you enough data to make your diagnosis so you you know about you have told about lot of things about the child abuse head injuries any future therapy which can change the cascade of changes for better outcome it's really pro- it's really uh, prevention like again one of the accomplishments that dr gulf yes. gulf yes. made during his uh, during his um his lifetime he unfortunately passed away at the age of 101 but yeah. uh, one of the uh one of the contributions he made was just the campaign to convince ch- parents that it's not okay to shake a child so this campaign this uh public uh, relations campaign which exposed the dangers of shaking a child actually had a significant impact on the incidence of abusive head trauma in in uh, yeah. the uk so prevention is very important yes very uh, and yeah so an environment healthy environment positive environment is very important for Mm-hmm. prevention yes um, so if there is no question any i can want to ask any question from dr eric you may ask dr ben yeah yes uh, may i ask a question thank you uh, uh, professor eric for your um, very comprehensive lectures so my first question is about the use of profile uh, prophylactic anticonvulsant So in those avulsive uh, head injury would you uh, use the prophylactic uh, anticonvulsants uh, for those with uh, intracranial uh, hemorrhage like the subdural or or intracerebral hemorrhages mm. and how long how long would you use it and another thing is about because like sometimes um, parents are concerned about uh, uh, the quality outcome of those uh, injured child so they are asking for like uh, some medication some neuroprotective medication is there any evidence uh, any uh, useful uh, drugs to use yeah like a lucho pill or cerebralizin is there any uh, drugs that come across you um, thank you so much mm-hmm. and great and really a great uh, great educational lecture oh, thank you well Usually when we manage these patients we manage them with pediatrics and so um I did not look specifically into the question of uh, using anticonvulsants but I will tell you that the uh, our the the people I work with uh, do tend to use uh, prophylactic anticonvulsants and when they do use them they usually keep them on for at least 2 to 6 months now mm-hmm. about the uh, about neuroprotectants uh, or uh, or 
I don't know how what they're being called now, but uh, I believe I don't think that there is any drug yet, any medication which has shown definite evidence of helping the uh, of helping a brain recover. It seems that brain repair is still the body's number one priority, and adding a neuroprotectant uh, doesn't really uh, improve results significantly. Hopefully, this will change. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, I want to add, uh, Dr. Ben. Uh, the EEG is very important. EEG tracking. We give it for one month to two months. If we have such a child, we give it for one to two months. Then we go for EEG. If EEG says no epileptic foci or uh, foci, uh, this type of uh, foci, then we stop it. This is Thank our you. policy. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. um, any anyone? So, yeah. uh, thank you, yeah. Doctor Eric, uh, Dr. for Shikha. your excellent yeah. presentation. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I have some question mm -hmm. for Professor Eric. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned regarding age. I just wanted to find out from you, in your opinion, what are the age of the child that resistant to abusive head uh, trauma? At what age you, however you shake, you won't cause injury. My second oh. question, <laughs> Professor. <laughs> Uh, you have mentioned about some of the long-term sequelae and uh, mortality uh, among a child with abusive head injury. Do you see any association with the onset of the first abuse event uh, or the duration of the abuse related mm. to the sequelae? My last question, Professor. Uh, those children uh, came with epilepsy or learning disability. Uh, how should we investigate whether they have underwent some form of uh, abusive event before? How do we do it? Thank you, Professor. Okay, now about the age. Again, I think it's not really the, the brain developing a resistance to being to uh, to shaking injuries. I think it's really the the age when a child can communicate that he's being shaken, that he's being abused. That that will be the cutoff for when the abuse will stop. You know, obviously, if the child can start telling people about it, the uh, the incidents will probably go down. Now, the uh, so I believe the second question was on the um, well. Uh, uh, the, the, we, the, can, the association of the onset of the first abuse event and the duration okay. of abuse with the sequelae. Okay. Uh, again, logically, it would seem that the earlier the abuse, the um, the the greater the potential for injury. But I would be hard pressed to give you exact uh, exact evidence which points to this. And uh, so I think it would be the it would just be a logical conclusion that the earlier the child was injured, the more that the uh, the, the more that there will be uh, consequences when he grows up. And the last thing is, can you sort of look back and see if a child was abused in the in the past? Um, hmm. uh, I I, uh, I think I I would have suspicions, but it would be very difficult to prove. It's something which is very difficult to prove. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, Probably is good discussion. Uh, may I may, may, may now we listen to the concluding remark from Professor uh, Sinha, Professor? Thank you. Um, so uh, we had a good discussion, and uh, if uh, no question, then we can go for the next presentation. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Uh, we have our second speaker, Professor Shiban here. Uh, may I call upon uh, Professor Salman Sharif to call upon our uh, second speaker, Professor? Um, dear friends, again, it's a pleasure to see you all. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, such uh, uh, the quality of the lecture was brilliant. I really enjoyed it, Eric. Uh, grateful. And as always, my friend Virendra uh, discussing it so well. Uh, we are missing uh, our friend, but still Bon Siung Liu is here to uh, give us company. Uh, so uh, again, uh, ACNS is doing, is doing a great job. Uh, so today, uh, the topic that we have is a uh, recommendation for fusion surgery. Where do we use fusion surgery in spine? So we have a very eminent speaker here with us, uh, Professor Shiban. You know, he doesn't need introduction. He's, uh, he's been uh, a major force in uh, spine surgery. So it's a pleasure to have you here. So I'm looking forward to his talk. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm going to try to share my presentation. My name is Eab Shiban. I'm a neurosurgeon in Augsburg. This is Bavaria near Germ near Munich. Um, skull base, neuro-oncology, and spine surgeon. I train in Munich with Bernard Meyer. And this talk is about indication for lumbar fusion in the degenerative spine. So this is how I look at things, how I try to uh, recommend surgery for patients uh, 
according to the evidence-based medicine we have. So these are my consult uh, disclosures have no real influence on the talk, a few of the spine companies, of course, but uh, doesn't really matter, to be honest. So I would like to talk about uh, different indications for lumbar stenosis, listesis, and chronic low back pain. I'll just uh, say a few words on that. Simply do not do surgery for low back pain. I'm not going to go into details. I'll remove the slides. So this is a, you know, a case that we all have, high-grade spondylolisthesis with back pain, symptomatic, so the radical leg pain, failed conservative treatment. Here, obviously, if you opt for fusion, it's not wrong. You can and you should if the patient has um, symptoms for a long time. The problem is what we always discuss with the American guys is these cases. You have a lumbar stenosis, 62-year-old man, two-year history of neurogenic claudication without major comorbidities. So if you talk to the guys from AO Spine or NAS, they all go for a two-level fusion, of course. But in Europe, we are much more reluctant. We only we try only to do decompression in those cases, and now we have evidence to show for that. Uh, a more difficult case where we are still discussing, even in Europe and in Germany, uh, this uh, young woman, uh, low back pain, sci uh, sciatica, uh, had a slight list. This is here, three, four, four, five. Many would go for instrumentation, semi-rigid or rigid instrumentation. But even here with a myodegrade one list thesis, now we have evidence to show that here you're also allowed or you can only do decompression. So this is the CT for the same lady. Again, if most of the surgeons here in Europe would go for instrumentation, some kind of instrumentation, but today I would like to show you why you should not. So basically a spinal canal stenosis, only decompression, obviously, yes. Myodin grade one list stasis, decompression diffusion, is it really necessary? I would recommend not to. So the problem is that we had data going back 20, 30 years ago showing or telling us that degenerative listasis is a sign of instability. And if you have a sign of instability, you need to do fusion. This is what, these were the first uh, two uh, studies uh, done 30 years ago telling us that um, clinical outcome after fusion for these patients is beneficiary. And that's why where it all started. Um, from the US uh, uh, where it came to Europe and we started to do impedic screw instrumentation at the beginning of the 2000s, basically. 20 years ago, we had this randomized controlled trial, uh, which was published in Spine in 97. Uh, this was the first randomized controlled trial on the degenerative spine. So it was a big deal back then. Looking at the added benefit of fusion, you see here, if you look at the data, you see that um, with or without instrumentation, you had more patients having a better outcome, yes, but you also had uh, patients that uh, without fusion uh, having a good, you know, here, 50% excellent results. Sorry about that. So um, if you say, well, why is he talking about fusion for lumbar stenosis? No one, no one is doing that. Well, well, if you look at the data from the US, this is a publication from JAMA 2010 looking at all sort of Medicaid uh, recipients, Medicare recipients. So, so it was a really go, a good cohort with really good data um, recruitment because it's always through the government. So, you know, you have to give every detail and get in order to get paid. Uh, you see here that with stenosis alone, 21% um, of patients had fusion surgery for stenosis alone. So you see it's still an issue. You see the numbers of instrumentation uh, complex fusion is going up, simple fusion is still high, and the number of decompression is even getting less and less with time in the U.S. at least. So 10 years ago, you all know about the SPAR trial. This was the biggest trial in spine surgery. It had three components, basically three big studies, one about disc herniation, one about lumbar disc stenosis, and the one I would like to talk about today is that degenerative spondylolisthesis one. It was a multi-center randomized control trial all the uh, uh, centers were in the U.S. They enrolled one to two level degenerative listesis uh, with back pain, with radic radical pain. Weinstein et al., everyone knows that by now, 2007 in New England Journal, randomized 304 patients. And the patients that did, wa did not want to be randomized for surgery or conservative treatment were asked to stay in a prospective cohort, the observational arm of the study, in order to, not to lose the data. So basically two prospective studies, one was randomized, you see here, 
159 were, were eligible to surgery, 145 for conservative treatment, and the other observer uh, arm was 173 patients choose surgery and 130 patients choose conservative treatment. And we had follow-up after two years. So before I go further, I don't want to bother you with statistics, but this is kind of important to understand the data. In a randomized control trial, we always have the problem of patient crossing over to the other treatment. What to do with a patient that is not happy with conservative treatment, goes to surgery. Do we analyze him as someone who had surgery or as someone who had conservative treatment? Or we just do not analyze him at all? So let's say we have these two treatments, surgical and conservative, doesn't matter what now for the analysis with the treatment. So, uh, and one patient does a crossover from conservative to surgical arm. What to do with this data? So first option is do not allow, analyze. It's called app pair protocol. The problem here is that we don't have good data out of this if we do not analyze, because as you can see here, 75% of patients had a good outcome and 100% of patients in the conservative treatment would have had a good outcome if we don't analyze them because three out of three are happy and we rule out the unhappy patients, which is statistically not good. The other option is the patient crosses over and we analyze as randomized. So we keep him, he goes to surgery, but we keep him in the conservative treatment and we analyze him as conservative treatment, which where, where he is unhappy. So now we have 75% in each group that were happy with the treatment, which is basically what we would um, recommend for analysis. Otherwise, uh, if you look at uh, the other option is to analyze him as treated. It's called the as treated analysis. It's also not as good as the intention to treat analysis because here you see now we have three out of five are happy with the surgery and three out of three of the conservative treatment, which is also not true. So the best way to analyze these kind of randomized controlled trials is the intention to treat analysis. This is the ITT. You see all randomized controlled trials because this is the best way to um, con deal with uh, uh, patients that are crossing over. Um, there's also an analyzed street. If the patient goes there, is is happy. So now you have four out of five are happy and still three out of three are unhappy in the conservative treatment, which is not true because if the patient was happy here, he wouldn't go to the other treatment. So that's why you'll always see the ITT analysis. This is the real analysis you want to see from the randomized control trial. From the SPORT trial, we had the problem that uh, many were treated not as they were analyzed to. The uh, dropout rate was 18%, which, which is okay. Uh, so you see here the random the data. If you look at the black lines, this is as treated, and the white lines or the uh, hollow ones are ITT analysis. So basically, the real analysis of the randomized controlled trial showed no difference between the patients. If you look at as treated, which is not as good as we said before, you see that surgery was better than conservative treatment. But basically, if you look at the ITT analysis, which were where the power of the primary outcome was made for in the study, this was a negative trial, but no one cared. We saw these numbers, we said surgery is better and just talked to everyone said here also for the SF36. Again, no difference between both groups. If you look at ITT analysis, and if you look at the as treated, the surgery was better, which is again, not really true. ODI the same, no difference between the groups in the ITT analysis. So now looking at the observation arm, these are patients that did, did not want to go to randomization. They chose surgery because they thought that surgery is better. And here you see the patient that thinks that surgery is better is gonna be also better off. This is the scale for pain. Surgery was better than conservative treatment. Uh, SF36 uh, also better for surgery and UDI also better, better in the surgical treatment. So uh, limitations here, high rate of uh, crossover. 64% of patients randomized to surgery did receive surgery, but 43% randomized to conservative treatment underwent surgery the other way. So we had many people crossing over, which made the ITT analysis very difficult. And that's why it's better to look at the ITT analysis because it's a real way to look at this data if you have a high crossover rate. So the consequences from uh, uh, the tr sport trial is that we now say that surgery is better because of the uh, as treated analysis, but we still didn't know, didn't know if we need to do fusion or not. The trial sport trial was 
surgery versus conservative treatment. Now we have three studies published in 2016, two in one New England journal and the last one last year. Also New England journal telling us that um, what to do with myodine grade one listesis to do fusion or not. The first one was the SLIP study from the US, randomized controls. They say five centers, but most patients were from one center. But never mind. They included myelin grain one spondylolisthesis with stenosis and had a follow up of four years. You see here that there were no significant difference between both groups, only decompression of fusion for UDI, no real difference in SF36. But the only difference was reoperation rate. Patients that only had decompression were opt for fusion surgery afterwards because they came back with back pain and the doctor said, okay, now we still have fusion and they did. This was a, a big difference, uh, 40, uh, almost 30, um, four, five percent to 4%, so a big difference. But they concluded that uh, laminectomy plus fusion was associated with slightly greater but clinically meaningful improvement, which is not true, to be honest. If you look at the statistic, there was no difference. This is the limitation, 77% were only from one center, so basically a big randomized monocentric trial. One of the things we, we said about the study is a high dropout rate, but you know, 74% after four years is really good, to be honest. It's not a really negative thing to say about the study. Um, but here, one of the big limitations is that uh, the characteristics of the patients before surgery were not uh, the same. Patients in the fusion group were better off even before surgery than um, patients receiving only decompression. And here you see in the, if you read the article um, is carefully, they say there were marginal non-significant differences in the baseline variables. This could have uh, accounted for some of the differences see, seen in the treatment. So not only there were no statistical difference between the groups after surgery, the uh, fusion group was better off before surgery even. So this was one argument, 34% versus 14% of uh, reoperation rate, but we really don't know uh, the real cause of fusion, if it's only back pain or index level, uh, you know, revision surgery. This is a better study, the Swiss study, uh, 2016, randomized control, 247 patients, many patients, they looked at uh, patients who had decompression alone or decompression and fusion. But to make a long story short, I'll just skip here to the data. Patients without degenerative spondylolisthesis, meaning patients with lumbar stenosis, with or without fusion, no difference. Patients with myodine grade one listesis, with or without fusion, no difference. And now this was a two-year data. Now we have five-year data published also, also no difference. So even in five-year um, follow-up, there's no difference between the uh, patients. So for this kind of cohort, you do not need fusion. Limitations here that we didn't know really how many were instable. There was no flexion in x-ray, but even if you don't look for instability, you have a very good outcome and no difference between fusion and not fusion. There was a Cochrane review looking at all these studies, also 2016, that concluded that there's no difference. I'll just go through the data, no difference in outcome. And the last one, which is all a very nice study, was published last year, also in the New England Journal, randomized control trial, 16 surgical departments. They even included patients with listes more than 20 or three millimeters, which are really, you know, indication of instability, true instability, randomized for fusion and decompression or decompression alone. And here to make also a long story short, no difference between both. So basically for degenerative spondylomyelitis grade one, list is this, with, with or uh, probably even without apparent instability or without apparent instability, but maybe even with apparent instability, you may get away with decompression alone. Here, the reoperation rate was also the same between both groups, 12 versus 9%. This was not statistically uh, different. So in conclusion, for degenerative listesis, SPORT trial was profusion, but the RCT was negative because there was no difference between the groups in the IIT analysis. The observational arm was positive for surgery. SLIP study, profusion, but had many limitations. The best study uh, was the Swedish study, contrafusion, Cochrane review, contrafusion, and then last study we have also uh, from 2021, also without fusion. So my recommendation would be is in the spinal canal stenosis with or without grade one uh, listesis, just do decompression only. 
And um, in about seven to eight percent of patients within five years, they will come back for index level surgery. But you need to talk to your patients, tell them that this might happen. Thank you very much. So that'll be it. I'll just unshare uh, my talk and open for questions. I think, Shiban, I think uh, uh, this is brilliant talk. We have all been talking about it for last um, seven, eight years that this is the way forward. Um, and the uh, you know I'm the chair of the WFNA spine committee, and right. we have uh, done consensus on this, and we have had looked at uh, last ten years data, and published that, and um, it's all out there, and the recommendations are all um, there for WFNA spine committee, and it clearly says what you're saying. Let me just quickly share this just to show you how you can access uh, all that data. One second, let me just see where do I where am I going. I think I know don't need Safari, Google Chrome. So here we are. So actually I had, so this is from the website itself. So I'll just take you back um, one second. Oh, okay, so this is WFNS Spine ORG. That's the website. And um, so on that, we, if you go on the top, so it tells you recommendations or publications. So recommendations are about cervical spondylotic myelopathy, stenosis, cervical trauma, spinal cord injury, thoracolumbar spine trauma, and recently osteoporotic vertebral fractures. And if you look, go into the publication, so let me go into lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, so there we are. So this is an editorial, um, and this, these are all published in World Neurosurgery Access. And all these journals are open access journals, so anybody can access them. So if you go into, we talk about fusion surgery, so fusion surgery, lumbar spinal stenosis. Let's see if I just open this. So this was published in July 20. And since then, you can see other um, articles that have come out as well. And if you go down and look at how it was done last 10 years data, and how you're going to diagnose, et cetera, why, what approaches, what surgeries, uh, fuse or not diffuse, and what we've just discussed. So look at the three studies that were out there at that time. And if you can see all these RCTs with good quality studies, but there are serious problems as suggested just now at Gogovala. Um, and if you look at the Swedish study, so actually really is, if you look at pros and cons, there is no difference shown in all three of these studies, uh, which is out there. And if you look at the quality of studies, so you can see that uh, if you give them scores, the uh, all these three studies are reasonable quality studies, but again, with problems of the, you know, for example, Swedish study only coming from one continent, Gogowala just from one institution. So if you look at the recommendations that we gave and the recommendations are out there. So unstable spinal disease the symptoms may require fusion. There is no consensus that the main complaint is mechanical axial low back pain, which is more than leg pain. Patient may benefit from fusion surgery. Patient with lumbar spinal stenosis and loss of sagittal balance, if symptomatic, may benefit from decompression, fixation, and deformity correction surgery. Fusion may be advisable in patients undergoing bilateral facetectomy of more than 50%. Um, facet joint effusion alone is no proven that you need to stabilize. There is, if there are no sign symptoms of instability and predominant leg pain, decompression alone is recommended. So I think unless if it's stable, and this lysthesis fusion is not mandatory and you know, decompression alone is suggested. So these are the guidelines which are out there for the last couple of years and you know, um, everybody is following, a uh, majority of lay people are following these guidelines in some countries because of um, various pressures and various issues and demand of patients. I think some people are making some interesting decisions, but I think overall what's happened is over time, we have realized that this is uh, not the way to go. So I think all this is out there and you know, we should be able to look at all this data, which is all available on all these topics. Then a lot of work has gone into it. So basically what we did was we got all the spine committee members from all over the world, sat down, did two sets of uh, sessions with them. And this, this is all um, uh, getting together and working for two days on these for um, all these topics. And uh, we have come up with uh, these recommendations and their brilliant uh, support that we had. And that's where we were able to uh, bring it out. And I totally agree, you know, excellent uh, work done by Shiban. And I'm, I'm so uh, glad that he's brought out the same point that we have been talking about. That, you know, if it's stable, if it's not moving, if it's not a mechanical problem, if it's uh, 
if the you know uh, leg pain is there predominant um, then you know you know simple way forward is to just decompress and that is the way forward um, so more and more people are doing that but i think uh, we need to get the message across thank you may i ask some question professor yeah, sure. Boom. Yeah, uh, pro Professor, I just want to uh, ask from you. Uh, this is quite a basic question that I do not know the answer. For those who came in with us, uh, probably low grade spondylolithesis and, and with acute low back pain, uh, why do we give only three months for conservative treatment? Is that why the magic number three months uh, in your experience? My second question, Professor, uh, do the decision to fuse or not to fuse related to the age, the onset of the the onset of the spondylolithesis? And my third question, Professor, uh, grade one uh, spondylolithesis, if we're going to be conservative, how do we follow up? Uh, how often do we do imaging, especially those with still having some mild pain, grade, I mean, uh, 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 four to five over 10 VAS? And my last question, Professor, uh, there are many people now out uh, to assess the instability and it was told that x-ray are not as good as CT scan. What is your opinion? Thank you, Professor. Professor Shivan, do you want to take them or do you want me to? It's, I don't mind. Please go, go ahead. ahead. Please well, go ahead. If you don't see it on x-ray, it's good enough. So be happy that you're not seeing it on x-ray. Don't look for instability. If it's instable, you will see it with x-ray. That's my how I try to teach my residents. So if it's Seen on X-ray, it's a real instability. Then you need to think about fusion. Yes. If not, you know, no upright MRI and all that crap. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, for age, obviously, is an issue. Always, I even now I I I do not do degenerative scoliosis anymore, which is an issue in Germany at least because I don't do it. People are not happy. I I don't think it's a good idea to do major surgery for an 82 year old de degenerative scoliosis. So there, I try to do decompression and see what happens and conserve the treatment and leave them alone. Obviously, age is a big factor, yes. And did I miss one question? The well, how how, how yeah, often do you follow? I do clinically, clinically. I don't do imaging routinely because you know if they are doing okay, it doesn't matter what I see on MRI. Um, so I just say, Boone, again, what we have done is we have, if you, um, what I just showed, all the recommendations are there. Recommendations are for diagnosis, follow-up, recommendations for radiology, which investigation you'll do, how you will follow, everything is given there. Which clinical signs and symptoms you'll take into account before you offer surgery or not offer surgery. And will you compi compound that with uh, maybe somebody having gout, maybe somebody having osteoporosis, maybe somebody having old age. So all those factors will play. And all those factors are also described there. Also, uh, the, you know, what kind of, where would you call it stenosis and where you, would you call it just narrowing? So all that is also, also there. So I think it's not one thing, but there are multiple things. But what has happened is industries driven all this for us and there are good things with industry, but at the same time, if industry asks us to make wrong decisions about our patients, then we should not, and we should not come under pressure. I know of so many spine surgeons who are my good friends will do things that we may think are is not in the favor of the patient and maybe in benefit of the people who are around us. So I think more and more we need to think that if I was this patient, if this was my brother or sister or mother, how would I treat it? So for example, if somebody who's 80, we have shown that, we have written that, that you, you, you know, if you are of that age above 65 and your mobility is not that much. And at the same time, you know, there, are, there is no reason to suspect anything. Even with uh, instability, many a times it's just possible to do that particular one disc micro uh, surgery and take away their pain and they do not require any major surgery in majority of the time. Because if you're going to try to correct curvature in a 75 year old or 80 year old, you know, 30% of them are going to have some side effects. And you know, about 20% of them, you may operate in next one month again. It's proven, yes. shown, it's all already there. So all that data we have looked up, got together, sort of starting from radiology to clinical diagnosis, to examination findings, to signs that are available, to um, uh, prognosis regarding radiology, when to fuse, when to do decompression, um, you know, uh, would you uh, correct deformity? Everything is, we have looked at in, in detail. So this is, 
And then what we do is once we do it for two days, we get all the data together and then we redo the same thing with other people doing presenting the same talks. So what happens is that automatically the data gets refined and polished and our bias, which we have in our head, goes away. So I think it's so important that we take away our bias and what Shiban has just shown is wonderful. I think that's what we need for more and more people, especially um, from the area that where a lot of this work is being done, which may not be required, not beneficial for patients. So one of my friends from Germany used to say all the time that, you know, if a patient needs decompression, we should choose. Why? Because they get to stay more, I get more money. And obviously, yeah, they, it's true. Um, so I think um, we need to, with time, they've realized that they were not doing the right thing. Now, even those same people now present and write the same thing that, yes. Uh, so, you know, once you go through all that, you realize that maybe th that wasn't the way, right way of going about it. So I think I, I'd request uh, everyone, especially the juniors, to look at the recommendation, look at those uh, papers and everything is there. And, and I'm so impressed that, you know, the new studies are showing the same, same thing. And, you know, um, I think we just need to update our recommendations as well. May I, may I just add one more question, uh, Professor? Uh, if we, we just uh, perform a decompression yard fusion, uh, would now the endoscopic procedure have advantage over the open surgery in terms of preservation of, of back muscle? Thank you, Professor. I think uh, the thing with minimally invasive surgery is mainly because of uh, the tubular retractor and not because of endoscope. So the results are better because of tubular retractor. So you may use microscope or endoscope, whatever you're comfortable with. The results actually are same because then the adjacent segment disease, et cetera, is lower. Back pain is lower. Your um, uh, you know, tension band remains intact. So all that is proven. So this is actually, there is a paper on MIS as well on our recommendation saying why we should be doing MIS and what kind of MIS. So you know, even in old age, try to do as little as possible, but even in young age, because you don't want them to coming back with an adjacent segment problem. And when you're opening, you know, young people are, you know, very uh, full of uh, passion and they open up much bigger than what's required. So try to do as little as possible. Yes. Try to do as less dissection as possible so that leave the nature uh, as it is and you'd give the best results. Just take out the problem and get out with leaving minimal uh, steps and debris behind. And mm -hmm. all that is so, so important. And we realize over time that, you know, pain, um, outcome, adjacent segment disease, all that is much better. So you save so much money in that um, by doing that. And those people then don't suffer with hardware complications when you try to do them in uh, that age group. So I totally agree that, you know, we need to go the way um, our guest speaker just talked about. And I'm so grateful that he's done one, a wonderful job for us. Thank you. There is a question, Professor Shiban, on the chat box. Reese stenosis cases, what's your view if no radiological stenosis? Yes. If it's not there, don't treat it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess. If it's an MRI, no stenosis. Well, the problem with MRI, even with uh, you know herniated disc, we know now for sure that if you do an MRI after surgery, you will see changes that does not do not matter. There was the study from Poel from the yeah. Netherlands, from Holland. He did an MRI one year after surgery in all patients who were conservatively treated or uh, surgically decompressed. And then he showed that after one year, there were as many herniated discs on MRI in patients where they were asymptomatic or symptomatic. The radiologist said in 35% in both groups, there was a herniated disc, but both groups had as good or as bad follow-up data. So MRI is confusing. Yes, so totally yeah. agree. I think Wilco did a great job by uh, looking at that particular point, and he was he's one of the authors in our recommendations as well. And uh, they also looked at people who had not had surgery and just doing MRI and symptomatic asymptomatic patients. It doesn't make any difference. You'll pick up disc prolapse in thirty five percent of the patient, but that does not mean that they require anything. It was just a, <laughs> a, a study that has shown that. So we have to be very careful. What we see on the scan, um, is it really matching? Have they really had conservative treatment? Am I uh, you know, doing things in a hurry? You need to look at all those points. And we learn, we mature with time. So I think uh, it's important that we learn from other people's experience instead of causing problems with your own patients. Right.
Any more questions that we have? There's one Comments. more question from Dr. Hashat again. Yeah. Oh, yes, the same question, actually. Yeah. They, they're asking whether will you now, if there's a reason, oh, yeah, I think you have answered the question. You will not do anything if there's no radiological uh, uh, changes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, any question from Ben or Dr. Same? Do you have any question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, probably we will hear the concluding remark from uh, Professor Shar Sharif. Professor? Um, I think, again, I'm grateful uh, for um, our speakers for uh, giving brilliant, both talks were brilliant, I enjoyed them. Um, I do a little bit of pediatrics and now and again, so I think I enjoy, enjoyed that as well. But majority of my work is spine as such. So I think, and uh, uh, the point that has come out is really, we need to be careful what we do with our patients. And over the years, we need to realize, we need to read uh, between the lines when you're looking at all these studies, which are claiming different things. So if you, if you look, really look at those studies, they showed no difference between the two on both sides, no matter what kind of study you look at. And if you look at the small print, there is always something that you'll pick up. So I think unless you read the whole paper and look at the uh, results in detail, you realize that what has happened. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Gogowala and um, um, Fort as well, and we have realized that um, they all had sincere efforts in it, but when they go to write it, stats guys give them right stuff for them, and then um, maybe sometimes we um, give statements which may not, which may cause serious problems, just like the Brecken study with steroids and all that in, in uh, 80s and 90s. So I think we just need to be careful how we treat our patients, and our patients come first before uh, we make any decision of intervening or not. And trying to correct um, uh, deformity in every patient in old age is not the way to go. It's been shown in all the studies of deformity that the more we operate, the more problems we give to patients who are of that age. So we, we need to have common sense. And so again, I thank the ACNS, um, Yoko, and all our friends, and the two speakers, and uh, my friend Vendra as well for uh, putting up such a great show again. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Okay. So okay. we're going to end our session today. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Gokato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Eric Legaspi and uh, Professor Ehab uh, Shiban, and as well as our Chair, Professor Virendra Dio Shinha, and also Professor Salman Sharif, for the time and support for the SNS webinar. I would like also express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. And today we have around 1,634 people joining us from three different platforms. Good. And also special thanks to Dr. Ben and Dr. Same for joining me today. So until we meet again uh, on Saturday, it's bye-bye from all of us. Uh, thank you very much for joining, Professor.